you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 15. As the days in our nation and in our world continue to grow darker with each day that goes by, and I I really don't think it's hyperbolic for me to say that. I I really don't. It's difficult for us to not be affected by what we're seeing especially in our country. All of us love our, our country. Um, I did a, the average age of our congregation. It, you wouldn't believe it, I, and I had to up it when I got some new information. Average age of our, our congregation is 65 years old. So many of us remember a time in America this is very different from this. And even just a f- few years ago. But for Christians, we have a way to deal with all this that's happening in a way that nobody else does. We have the ability and the necessity to focus our attention on our king during this life. Our primary focus in life should always be on Christ and his glory in our personal lives and as well in the life of our church. Why has the church lost so much influence in our nation? Well, because around the time that the Cultural Revolution started in the 60s, things that led up to that, but around that time especially, the church, instead of acting like the church and being a prophetic witness to the rapidly changing culture that was happening during that time period, Instead of being that witness, the church began to actually accommodate the culture. And it watered down the truth. And I'm speaking of the church in general. And it dumbed down theology. And it, and it became very man-centered in order to appeal to the culture. And those failures inside the church made the church in America weak and impotent and rendered it completely useless in the large majority of cases to do anything on the outside to even slow down the progress of the godless secularism that has now taken over our culture completely here in 2024. That's how we wound up redefining marriage, first nation to do so in the history of the world. Abortion up to the moment of actual birth in the ninth month and even after birth. Transgender rights, child mutilation, men playing in women's sports and illegally going into women's bathrooms and actually, literally, and I've said this before, actually having debates over whether a man can have a baby. That blows my mind every time I think about it. All of that in its fullest form really came about in just the last nine years. You know when the Obergefell decision to legalize sodomite marriage happened? 2015. That's just nine years ago. And we have gone with light speed to a 
a whole nother dimension in this country since then. First Peter chapter one, verse 17 is exactly right. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. I'm here to tell you that the church has failed our nation. Time and time and time again, the church has not stood up in the culture when it was time to stand up and said, no, we will not have this. We've had the numbers, but we failed in whole. And that's how we got to where we are today. And worse than this, in so many cases, as I said earlier, the church has tried to act like the world in order to attract the world. You might have seen recently last week the, the dust up with Mark Driscoll and the pastor who came out on the stage to twirl around on a stripper's pole and, 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 and swallow a sword in the church. I don't know if you saw that. It's real. But the reality is for the church to truly reach the world, we have to refuse to be like the world. We have to be the opposite. The church must refuse to define itself by what the world wants, by what unbelievers want. And that starts inside, in here, by our being focused as a body of Christ, a local church, on the supremacy of Christ. That's where it starts. We have to get that straight before we can ever think about going outside and influencing the culture. Churches will always have very little influence in the world if all they are busy at doing is trying to give the world what it wants rather than obeying the head of the church, King Jesus. And believe me, he never ever commands what the world wants for his church. Never. His message, as I said earlier, is the most offensive message in the world, the gospel. The gospel offends the natural man. There is no text in the entire New Testament that commands the church to give the lost what they want to make them like us so that they will come to our services. Check your Bible. You won't find a verse. The church's true responsibility is to be obedient to the chief shepherd. And he left us an instruction manual that shows us how to do that. If the church has little influence in the, in the world, we don't ask the question, well, then what does the world want? As many do. Rather, we should be asking, what does the Lord require? And the answer is, <laughs> he requires us to be the church. Now, that's not real deep but we don't seem to be getting it in the church in America these days. We want to, as Spurgeon said, amuse the goats today. Uh, let's take a survey of what the children of the devil want and then we'll pattern our church after their answers in the survey. You might think I'm joking, but that's what a lot of, what a lot of churches have done. Willow Creek being the biggest did that very thing. And the results of that have been, especially over the last 25, 30 years, a lot of mega churches, huge mega churches have developed that pattern and thousands of people come with zero impact on the culture from those churches. None whatsoever. In the Reformation, there was a principle that was articulated called the formal principle, which is defined as 
The word of God is the sole authority in the kingdom of God and therefore in the church. So the church is to be whatever the word of God tells it to be. We only have one divine revelation for the life of the church, and that is the scripture. And as we study the New Testament epistles, like Ephesians here, we find that these epistles are designed to make sure that every generation of Christians and churches understands the will of God for their life and for their conduct. They're filled with this. And that's especially true of this book of Ephesians, as we talked about in earlier messages. There is not one word in this epistle about what the world wants. Not one. It's all about how to follow King Jesus on his terms. It's all about placing our focus on Christ. And that's why it basically starts out, look in verse 3 once again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. As we saw last time, everything is in Christ in these opening verses. The first 14, we looked at it last time. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Just scan your eyes through those verses. It's all about our relationship with Christ, knowing Christ, worshiping Christ, studying Christ, declaring Christ, and all throughout our life being conformed by God to the image of Christ. Because wonder of all wonders, we are going to have our existence eternally as joint heirs with Christ. That's why he's conforming us to the image of Christ now. The more that the church tries to be like the world in order to appeal to the world, not only does it does it forfeit its influence in the culture, it causes massive problems within the church. How many scandals of pastors and church leaders have we witnessed in the 20th and 21st centuries. It's just scandal after scandal after scandal. It's extremely dangerous for any church anywhere to be anything other than what the Lord of the church has designed the church to be. And that's what we're striving to be here at Providence. And we have all the information, again, that we need in order to carry that out. In the New Testament. This isn't the Lions Club. This is the Lion of the tribe of Judah's church. Now, I want to remind you that the, the first three chapters of Ephesians emphasize doctrine. We get high theology. This is the things, these are the things that we believe. And then, The last three chapters, as often is the way Paul does in all of his epistles, is the practical section. The last three chapters are going to be, okay, now that you know this, this is how we are to behave. So, And how we behave is predicated by what we believe. So right now we're still in this section of what we believe. (laughs) And what is so interesting about this section that we're fixing to study, starting in verse 15 is it's almost like there's this abrupt interruption in the flow of what Paul has been laying out for us in the first 14 verses. It's like, here he is, man, we're in this flow, and he's given us this deep theological treatise that includes predestination and redemption and the glory of Christ and and, and the work of the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, he just 
can't go a step further unless he offers a prayer for the church, like right, bam, in the middle of it. Remember, he, he, he's writing to the church in Ephesus. It's been four years since he's been to this church. And also remember that, that this is a letter that made the rounds to the other churches. Remember, I explained all that to you in detail. And in the middle of, of this, this just magnificent flow of sound doctrine, he, he breaks into prayer. And let's read it together in verses 15 to 23. He says, For this reason, too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And here we go. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That is a total Christ-centered truth prayer right there. And Paul is praying that the church, clearly, that the church would focus fully upon Christ and also not only upon Christ, but what is theirs in Christ. And this is a charge to every faithful pastor that possesses a spine in this country. It is the duty of every faithful pastor to live in the constant expression of a desire to see the church filled with the wisdom and knowledge that comes with a deep revelation of Christ, who Christ is, what Christ has done, what is ours as the result of being in him by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So now, get your shovel out and let's start digging in to the text. Verse 15, it starts out this way. For this reason, now stop digging right there. What reason? What is it that prompts this intercession by Paul for the church? What what is it that motivates this, this gratitude and this request for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ? For this reason, notice, look in your Bible, follows directly on the heels of the amazing, incomparable blessings of Christ that he just listed in verses 3 to 14. In those verses, you get blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing, and then verse 15, for this reason. You follow me? If you miss any of the first 14 verses that I preach, go back and watch or listen on our Facebook page. Uh, the technology is great when it's used for good, right? And again, I have to say this, verse 3 is the big 
picture summary statement. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Here it is. Look at it. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and then to make sure you get it in Christ. He wants to make sure you get it. And then he goes through a list of some, the major ones, as we looked at already, all the way through verse 14. For this reason, Paul is saying, I am praying, and skip to verse 17 to the prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And that's just the start of the prayer. Paul wants the church, not only the church at Ephesus, but the church for all human history to know Christ. Remember what he said in Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Now, Paul knows that he is writing to a true church because look what he says next in verse 15 having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. That is two great evidences of salvation right there. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and manifest love for the saints. Now, how did Paul know about this? Well, notice in verse 15, he says this. Having heard of. Now, how would he hear about it? Well, remember at this point, he's been a prisoner in Rome. Like we were a prisoner for a moment to that phone going off. Christie's new iPhone that she must have left in her purse. Or I think we got Kimberly's phone there. Remember, he's a prisoner in Rome. He hasn't seen these people in four years. He's incarcerated. But remember, we went all through this in Colossians. He could receive letters and he could receive visitors. And as you know, he received both letters and visitors while he was in jail in Rome. And so the testimonies coming from this church at Ephesus were always the same. It was all about the the faith of the people and the love that they had for the saints. Again, evidences of a true biblical church. Paul says the same thing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. Look at it. Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love. Faith and love together. Trusting in Christ, loving the saints. That's a mark of a true church. That's what we should be all about. Trusting in Christ, loving the saints. Loving one another. That's what a true church is. That's how you know it's a real church that's made up of true, redeemed, regenerate people. Sadly, there are churches with real Christians in them that have no clue about the depth and the profundity of what is theirs in Christ because they are not taught the Word of God. They're given life coach messages, life coach messages with Bible verses attached. And then their motives and their interests are all over the place. Instead of being taught Christ from the text. Paul says next in verses 16 and 17, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit Spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Well, what does a spirit of wisdom mean? Well, spirit here is used in the sense of perspective, disposition, attitude. This is the way, Paul is saying, you need to direct your mind and your thoughts. I want, he says, God above to give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That is what every pastor should be praying for every church. 
lost, as it says, in wonder, love, and praise for Christ. It's only then that the church becomes the church. This is so far away from the methods and motives of the typical man-centered churches of our day. Paul is saying, I want so badly for believers to fully grasp all the spiritual blessings that are in the heavenlies in Christ for believers. So I need to be praying then for you to have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. I need to be teaching you about that and you need to be making application of what you learn in your life. And then, and only then, are we ready to engage the culture and this nation which is right now under the well-deserved judgment of God? These things need to be continually ongoing in the life of our church until we die or until Christ returns. And Peter, he's right in line with Paul when he writes in 1 Peter 1 verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So everything pertaining to life and godliness becomes ours through the true knowledge of Christ. The more you know of Christ, the more you comprehend of Christ, the more you grasp and enjoy the fullness of the riches that you have in him. And the better you can navigate life with all of its ups and its downs and its twists and its turns and its storms and its trials, which we all have continuously every day in this life until the day that we go to where our citizenship is promised and sealed by and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul wants us to know everything about Christ that we can know. All that we can take in in this life. He wants us to know about all the spiritual blessings that are ours, again, as a result of being in Christ. This is where our preoccupation should be. This is what we should be focusing on most, studying, learning, again, making application with our li- in our lives with it. Let me tell you, a church made up of people like that, no matter how small, absolutely will influence the world. Now, just for a minute, indulge me. Because it's not just here. Let's let the Word of God speak to this issue from other places as well. Look, look, look at John 1.14. And the Word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And and look at verse 16. For of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Let that sink in. Grace upon grace. Get you some understanding of that right there. You having a hard time today? Get you some understanding of that right there. And your hard time will get a lot smaller for you. Do you know Christ in that depth? John 15, 5. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you could do nothing. That's much spiritual fruit. And that is a part of spiritual blessing. Colossians 3.11 at the very end, Christ is all in all. 1 Corinthians 1.30, but by 
His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, God's sovereignty. You can't escape it anywhere in the Bible. Who Christ became to us. What? Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let me ask you, believer, what more could you want than wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption? What more could you want? And Paul says here, it's all in Christ. And then he says next in verse 31 to cap it off, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul says in Philippians 3, 7 through 8, but whatever things were gained to me. And he had a lot. Education, Pharisee, all of that. Those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that. More than that. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. The rubbish there refers to garbage or waste and it even can be translated as manure or dung. Paul says everything in the world is garbage. It's dung except Christ. He says, I'm glad to give it all up for Christ. That is the attitude, folks, that we should live and move and have our being in as we spiritually grow day by day a preoccupation with Christ and his work, all that he is, all that he has done, all that he is doing. In the Old Testament, he is anticipated. In the New Testament, he is revealed. He is the revelation of God that is the most clear revelation that there is. And Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2 tells us, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in his way, in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things, and by the way, through whom also he made the world. He has spoken to us in his Son. God is on full display in Christ. Again, remember from our recent study, Colossians 2, 3, speaking of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom, and knowledge. That's in Christ. Colossians 1 verses 28 to 29. We proclaim him, Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Verse 29, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Paul is saying, I got one objective in life. To bring people to Christ and then once they have been brought to Christ to admonish them and to teach them with all heavenly wisdom so that they can be complete in Christ. And at this point I can't help but remind you a little bit about who we're dealing with in Christ. We we studied it but you should read it every day. Colossians 1, 15 through 18, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Remember, that's angels. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That's Christ. That's our king. And we must spend our lives learning him learning about our king because he is the preeminent king of all the universe, 
over every king. And remember that warning from Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. Now look, I love Jordan Peterson. He's a brilliant man. He says great things. He's getting close, it appears. He's not quite there. But Jordan, repent and believe on Christ's terms and then I'll really start listening to what you have to say. There will always be an endless effort, of course, run behind the scenes by the enemy of our souls to seduce the minds of the people in the church with the philosophical, the psychological, the social politics, the efforts that are all full of vain deceit in the traditions of men. Verse 8 here also calls them the elementary principles of the world, which is so interesting. You know what that means? Baby talk. Elementary principles of the world. That's what human philosophy is. Baby talk. People who hold to that and not to the wisdom and knowledge of Christ think that they are so sophisticated and us down here, we're just the poor little Bible-toting hillbillies. Just, Just barely got a few brain cells popping. Now, of course, they do have a certain degree of human sophistication in all kinds of areas. You can think about very smart people like in science and mathematics and engineering and all types of uh, uh, areas. They have good good things, good ideas, helpful stuff from, from man's point of view. But, but, but understand that human philosophy is a way of trying to understand the world and the human condition while ignoring or rejecting the true God of the Bible. And all you can ever get out of that is vain, empty deception and nothing but these human ideas passed down from generation to generation to generation all through history. In reality, human philosophy is simplistic. Now, Listen carefully. Simple is good. Simple means it's not complicated. But simplistic is not good. If somebody says you're simplistic, that means you're not giving a reasonable response. Simplistic is to underestimate the reality of something. And the great irony is this. If there does come about any advice or position of value from philosophy or psychology, it always has its roots in biblical truth anyway. Just check it out. You can trace it right back. What we need to have, folks, more than anything, in order to guard against human wisdom that's constantly flooded at us through the media and all the rest, what we desperately need to have is conviction as Christians. We have to have some biblical non-negotiables. We have to have some hills to die on. As we often say, you have to know what you believe and why you believe it, and you should be able to articulate that to people. You have to have biblical convictions to the intensity that you are willing to suffer and even die, if need be, for them, if that would be the case in God's will for you. John MacArthur says, your convictions are the immovable pillars of your character. This world system is very evil. And for now, 
God allows Satan on God's leash to have a lot of control in it and over it for his purposes. And he is the father of lies. And he will always, always attack our convictions about God, about man, about sin, about conduct, about righteousness, about morality, about everything. He will always attack our convictions about those things. And that's why we have to hold fast and strong to our godly, unwavering, immovable, biblical convictions. We have to stand firm in this day. And in line with this, necessity, especially today, we have to possess critical thinking. You have to have it. We have all these these mindless ideologies out there. What's wrong in America? Systemic racism. Huh? Climate change. Right? Right? Corporations are getting rich while the common folks are oppressed and kept poor. Let me tell you something. They want you to buy into the fact that everything that is wrong in America can be explained by an ideology. They do not want you to think critically about it. And the most troubling reality is our college students are receiving the brunt of this. And they are the people that are going to be running everything pretty soon. Critical race theory, DEI. If there's a hurricane, oh, that's climate change, even though we've been having hurricanes every season going back to the beginning of the curse. If the bus doesn't show up on time, systemic racism. Let me tell you, cultural Marxism has done quite a number on this nation. Again, John MacArthur says that's the stupidity of the oversimplification of everything. That it's easy for people to suck up and be seduced by it because it's a one-size-fits-all answer to everything and you can put your brain in a bag and bury it. And that's what they want us to do. So I'm here to tell you, we have to think as Christians critically. Consider this. In the United States... 99.9% of the population survives COVID and look at what they did. Think about that. They lied about COVID. They lied about the vaccines and continue to lie big time about the vaccines. The FBI, the CIA, all the intelligence services of our government lie. They, they, they were used by a political party to go after political opponents like in Colombia or Venezuela and get caught. The evidence is clear for everybody to see and nothing happens to anybody. That's what we're living in right now. I'm telling you the chaos and deception in this nation are at an all time high. And if you want to navigate life in this country, you have to think critically. And guess what? You need to know what's going on in order to do that. Now listen, you don't need to be obsessed with the news. You need to be obsessed with Christ. But if you don't have some idea of what's happening in this world when the gulag truck pulls up at your house, you're going to be mighty surprised and you're not going to know how to process it because you weren't paying attention to anything. Listen, can capitalism be abused? Yeah. Can socialism? Always. Anything can be abused by fallen sinners living in a fallen world. But what they want is for you to just buy into what they're selling and shut down any alternative discussion. That's what we're living in right now. That's why cancel culture exists right now. If you don't buy into the narrative, they work to shut you down and shut you up. And we have seen it happen. Those doctors that were telling us ivermectin was good It was a good thing. It was knocking COVID out. You didn't need anything else. What did they do? Shut them down. Took them off Twitter. Took them off YouTube. 
because they don't want anybody to think critically. But guess what? By necessity, Christians have to think critically because we think biblically. That's the tail end of 1 Corinthians 2.13. But we have the mind of Christ. And with that, you will never be simplistic. Human wisdom is infinitely infantile compared to godly, divine wisdom every day and twice on Sundays. Well, that was really like the intro to verses 15 to 23. And I really appreciate you putting up with me. The point is this. Think like a Christian. Think biblically. Think big picture. Think eternal perspective. Think like Christ. Be focused on Christ. Pay attention to what's going on. And don't be kidnapped in your mind by the lies of the elite and the people who are running this nation who are absolutely, purely evil in every form. All of that is a part of living for God's glory. And when you live for God's glory, Jesus already tell, told us, everything else will take care of itself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for truth. We live for truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Therefore, we live for Christ. We live for his glory. We live for the day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. That day is not yet. While we wait, while he tarries, we are to be busy in your vineyard, thinking critically, thinking biblically, striving to live for your glory. God, grant us grace upon grace as you already have. Pour more grace and more grace upon us so that we might do just that, to live our, our lives out with the big picture perspective, the eternal perspective, recognizing that soon and very soon, this will all be over and we will be like Christ, which is what you have ordained for all who believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.